good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Jubilee Year Speaker Series, highlighting the saints whose statue is in our worship space. So tonight is the fourth presentation, and today's saint is Saint Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, also known as Saint Edith Stein. So just as a quick introduction to this series, and I know some of you have heard this story if you've been here before. So the inspiration came actually from Father Greg, whom some of you might know, he's a Carmelite priest. So he came here one time and we were having this conversation and somehow the topic of our Jubilee year came up. It's our 150th anniversary. So I was thinking of ideas. How do we celebrate our Jubilee year? So he suggested, you know, why not have a speaker series on, the, on our statues here in church? And he realized that some of them are you know, what we would consider modern day saints. You know, they, they lived in the 20th century. And one of them is you know, today's saint, you know, Saint Edith Stein. And our speaker for tonight is Dr. Michelle Keeter Peterson. Michelle began her adult faith journey as a kindergarten catechist for her daughter and son's classes at the Regina Religious Education Program. Then she coordinated the Tri-Parish Religious Ed Program for the Iowa City Parishes while teaching at Regina Elementary and Junior and Senior High School for several years. She later became Director of Religious Education at St. Thomas More Parish for 10 years and returned to graduate school at the University of Notre Dame, where she got an MA in theology, followed by the University of Iowa, where she received her PhD in religious studies. Since re receiving her PhD, she has also taught religion at Cornell College, philosophy at Clark University, and philosophy and religious studies at Mount Mercy University. Michelle has recently kept busy preparing for a teaching appointment as visiting assistant professor of theology and philosophy at St. Ambrose University for the 2022 to the 2023 academic year. Michelle's book was recently published, A Hermeneutics of Contemplative Silence, Paul Ricoeur, Edith Stein, and the Heart of Meaning. And Michelle also recently published a book chapter entitled Love Divined, Discerning a Contemplative Ethic in the Philosophy of Edith Stein in a book called The Ethics and Metaphysics in the Philosophy of Edith Stein, Applications and Implications, Women in the History of Philosophy and Sciences. And one more good piece of news to share is that Michelle has been invited to collaborate in sharing her understanding and judgment with the coordinating group of the Carmelites in Rome at the Pontifica Faculta Theologica Teresianum for the preparatory work for the cause of Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, Doctor of the Church. So please welcome Dr. Michelle Keeter Peterson. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. And I think uh, realizing we're still in the middle of the pandemic, this is the first time in a, a sort of a public um, activity that I've been in, and what a gift it is to uh, be with people and, and to share life with people, and especially in this setting. I'd like to um, open tonight by um, holding in remembrance not only this is the feast day or the memorial of Edith Stein, um, who was martyred at Auschwitz, but also I want to hold in remembrance, and it uh, to me has really even deeper and more profound meaning than ever, 
um, in these times in which we're living. Um, let us also hold in remembrance Nagasaki um, and the people who perished there and let us keep in mind and hold in prayer all of those people and all victims of war and violence everywhere in all times and places and especially in our own day. I would like to open uh, tonight uh, and sort of just invite you to enter into a peaceful, prayerful stance as I read these words. Uh, these were the words of Edith Stein. It's a paragraph from her address on April 12, 1928 to the 15th Convention of the Bavarian Catholic Women Teachers Association. The personal attitude is objectively justified and valuable because actually the human person is more precious than all objective values. All truth is discerned by persons. All beauty is beheld and measured by persons. All objective values exist in this sense for persons. And behind all things of value to be found in the world stands the person of the Creator who as prefigurement encloses all earthly values in himself and transmits them. In the area of our common experience, the human being is the highest among creation since his personality is created in the image of God. It is the whole person about whom we are speaking, that human being in whom God's image is developed most purely, in whom the gifts which the Creator has bestowed do not wither but bloom, and in whom the faculties are balanced in conformity to God's image and God's will. The will led by intellect and the lower faculties bridled by intellect and will. Each human being is called naturally to this total humanity and the desire for it lives in each one of us. I think that's a, a beautiful prayer and a really wonderful way to start out tonight. We see the influence of, of uh, St. Thomas Aquinas in there, but also um, of her, uh, you know, experiential philosophy of phenomenology that she studied under her mentor, uh, Edmund Husserl, in that, you know, she's looking at different ways of describing the experience of what a human being is in the eyes of God. So I'd like to start out tonight by just sharing a personal anecdote about my first experience of reading Nita Stein um, when I was studying theology at the University of Notre Dame. And I was um, taking a course on the Carmelites, on Carmel, and I read the science of the cross. And you know, it, we were going to be covering it over several days. It's an accelerated program, but um, nonetheless, I still had several days to do it. But I became so involved in this experience, I suppose from a, a kind of a phenomenological or an experiential perspective, that empathically, um, I couldn't put this book down. 
and I, I stayed up all night reading, and it was just like in the middle of the book where she engages in interpolation and an interpretation and sort of breaks John of the Cross open in a wider way. Um, you know, her, her description of the human being um, in contemplation and in contemplative prayer, just sort of the scales fell from my eyes from an intellectual perspective, but also it was a more embodied experience, but I'm not saying that, um, you know, I had a vision of God or anything. It was more like she was explaining the intricacies of what goes on in that whole dynamic between reason and faith that John Paul II talks about um, in his uh, document, Reason and Faith. Um, and so, you know, even though I was exhausted, I, I also had this overpowering sense of the darkness of, you know, just being in the human condition, and it's the darkness of faith. And, you know, just the idea of the, the sort of knowing that we don't know um, in life. And, and so that darkness, though, was so pervasive and um, it felt like being in an abyss that the only remedy for me was to keep reading. And so I kept reading and I kept reading and, and to make a long story short, I read this book in one setting and, you know, finished it early in the morning and I was just like, you know, kept going through, but it was like, I could not put this down. It was so, it weighed so heavily on me that I wanted to let go of it, but I knew that the only way to deal with this was to go through it. And, you know, that's sort of the, you know, faith journey sometimes when we were met with obstacles in life or, you know, experiences that we've all just, you know, been working through this pandemic in our various ways, um, things we don't have control over. Um, but then just to learn how to be with that. And that was my first experience of reading Edith Stein. And, you know, from there, I just fell in and knew that I just had an intuitive knowledge that this is where my work in the church and, you know, outside of the church and, you know, um, uh, from an academic perspective in academia, I had this... Um, intuitive sense that this is where I needed to be with her uh, body of works. Um, so I think that, you know, in reading that, I had the experience of the, the weight of the human condition um, and the fact that, you know, it's not only me, but we share in that human condition. Um, and there's something you know, similar and common about all of us in that we all have that experience, but it's an experience that's different according to each one of us and who we are in the Imago Dei or the image of God. Um, usually, you know, I save remarks like this till the end, but I thought it's probably more practical in the opening to, you know, uh, cover a few things and. And my suggestion would be, if you've never read her, and I, I know that there you know, is a um, core group here who's deeply immersed in her and the other Carmelites, but if you've never read her, my suggestion would be to begin with her book of letters. Um, and she has the self-portrait in letters. There's also, um, a book of letters between her and or her letters uh, to Roman and Garden. Um, but this, this uh, self-portrait in letters, 1916 to 1942, covers the span of her years, um, you know, from studying under Edmund Husserl, and then, you know, it takes her to the very end to 1942 when she's, you know, basically hauled off out of the um, uh, Carmel and Act. And then the other book would be her autobiography, Life in a Jewish Family. And this has come out in a second edition. 
and I'll have these books up here afterwards if anyone is interested. Um, so those two, these are like essential reading and, and um, you know, if you look back at this uh, from a scholarly academic perspective, these are sophisticated and yet when I first was reading her and becoming familiar with her life, um, these, these are, you know, about um, everyday things in, in addition to her faith journey and so forth. So I can't recognize, recognize these, um, you know, uh, recommend these to you enough. And it's funny because um, I was thinking about that and I thought I have to be sure to, you know, this is really important to get this in. And I received an email today from Father John Sullivan wishing me feast day greetings. And um, he proceeded to share some photographs with me of uh, uh, Josephine Keepel, who was the Carmelite who did the translation and the wonderful translations of these books. And he had photographs of her from years before. And, you know, he wrote up a really beautiful reflection on her. Uh, for I, th I think he might be posting it on his blog. But in any case, he's, he mentions these two books, and I, you know, sent a note back wishing him a, a happy feast day memorial. And I shared with him that I had this on my to-do list for tonight for this talk uh, to recommend these books. So um, you'll be in very good company by uh, looking and reading these if you have the opportunity. And then the other thing would be the hidden life. If you're you know, more appreciative of beginning with devotional works of hers, these essays, meditations, and spiritual texts, there are some in here that have to do with uh, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross um, and, and other, you know, Carmelite saints. So uh, I would recommend this. This is a little slim volume, and this is all available uh, from the Institute of Carmelite Studies um, from their website. And then finally, there is a book of um, her life in photos and documents. And this is really wonderful. For example, it has a photo of her um, family home in uh, Breslau, in what was Breslau, Germany, but then post-World War II with the newly divided uh, uh, lands in Europe. Uh, it became Rorikov, Poland. And there is a center that they've built. Uh, miraculously, this house was still standing, and it, it's a quite large home. There's a, a beautiful photo of it in here. But they've also added on a glass um, top to this, and it's become a Carmelite center for study, and they hold conferences in Poland. Um, and some of these are international, but also uh, you can apply uh, to do some study there as well. And there are actually some of the lower floor rooms are set up so that, um, you know, some of the rooms look as if the Stein family is in. Um, and then other rooms have been, you know, renovated so that conferences and such can be held. Um, I've not personally been there, but I'm on the uh, email list of the newsletter there, and you know I keep hoping that one year the ISPES conference, that is the International Association for the Study of the Philosophy of Edith Stein, uh, will be held there. Um, and so those would be some books if you're um, interested in, in uh, reading her. I would begin with those. And then before I sort of launch into the, my official talk, I'd like to just tell a little bit about the ISPES group, or for short, it's called the Stein Circle. As I say, it's the International Association for the Study of the Philosophy of Edith Stein. And for those of you who, you know, have read about the um, uh, sculpture here of Edith Stein, you would be familiar with that group. But when I first um, came here and uh, met with uh, the Carmelite 
third order Carmelite lay group, I was so incredibly impressed with this parish because that group is mentioned in the write-up on the statue for St. Patrick Parish. And I just, I, you know, the adrenaline is flowing through me as I say this, but that is truly uh, tremendous. Um, I think sometimes, uh, I don't want to get preachy or anything, but, you know, the exercise of the intellect and the use of reason in symbiotic relationship, as John Paul II says, with faith is so very important um, in the church. And while the International Association for the Study of the Philosophy of Edith Stein exists specifically to promote her philosophy so that that doesn't get lost in all of this, you know, talk of sainthood and doctor of the church and so forth, um, the uh, association welcomes and has um, Jewish members who consider her, and out of respect for Judaism, would consider her to be um, an apostate to the Jewish faith. But also, um, you know, Carmelite priests, lay Carmelites, lay people interested in her work from an academic perspective, and it also is a very ecumenical group, and, and everyone is really respectful when we get together at these international conferences. Everyone is quite respectful of the language that we use. For example, the rumblings at our last conference in Cologne, at the University of Cologne, for our, our meeting. We also hold our biannual meetings then. Um, within the Carmelite community, you know, promotion. Uh, for her ecclesiastical doctorate was very much, you know, in the conversation in and between the sessions and so forth. But during our meeting, it was brought up, but yet very respectful of people who might teach at uh, non-Catholic universities, but other religiously affiliated uh, colleges and universities in the Christian tradition. And to make a long story short, people from all different scholarly backgrounds. And so there is so much that goes on with this group in addition to promoting her philosophy because if there's one beautiful thing about her life, she was always interested in, she kept up such deep family relationships after her conversion to Catholicism. And, um, you know, even upon her entering the uh, Carmelite monastery, her letter writing is so profound. But she's so respectful, and it, it just shines through her philosophy and her theology, the fact that we all, whatever our backgrounds, we share our humanity with others, and that happens through personal relationships at all different levels of engagement. And that is very much reflected in the ISPES group and the Edith Stein Circle. And the other thing I'll just add as an addendum, that group exists to promote her works in the English language, since because she writes in German, and uh, Europe is full of scholarship on Edith Stein, but here in this country, not so much known about her. So one of the um, ideas behind this group is to promote her works in English, but not exclusively. Um, uh, for example, uh, you know, the idea is, from what I'm hearing, probably the next conference in 2023 will be back in person, will probably be in Avila, Spain. So, you know, um, uh, the, the, you know, sort of the core group of officers try to rotate where this is and, and rotate the languages so it's indeed polyglot in terms of you know, the languages um, that are used. So, in terms of, you know, sort of getting on with things, um, I want to just share a few reminiscences of my uh, first visit to Cologne in August of 2019, and the Cologne Carmel, uh, where the Edith Stein archive is. Um, First of all, just to give you a little history, and the history is actually, some of this is contained in this book, and it actually has photos of 
some of what, his, what was uh, subsequently uh, destroyed during World War II. The Carmelites uh, came to Cologne in 1637, and ultimately, Edith Stein, as we'll learn from the timeline that I'm going to share with you momentarily, she entered the Carmel in Cologne. Um, so they came to Cologne in 1637 and built a late Baroque church called uh, San Maria von Frieden, or St. Mary of Peace, and they had to leave the property in 1802. So that was the first uh, establishment of a Carmelite convent. The second one took place 30 years later. The Carmelites started a new foundation close to the Romanesque Basilica of St. Gerion, the patron saint of Cologne, and remained there until 1875 when Bismarck came to power. And due to the secularization laws and so forth, the actual convent became an institute uh, for uh, quite a while until post-World War II. So because of that, the secularization laws, that had to become an institute, and so there was no, strictly speaking, Carmel now. So then, the third rendition was in 1899, the Cologne Carmel was activated for the third time in Cologne Lindenthal on Duriner Street, where Edith Stein eventually entered the order. And there is a photo of it in there, as I say, but it was destroyed during World War II. Um, today, um, a group of us uh, walked from the uh, university there, from the conference, and we walked to this site, and there's a, you know, the inlaid plaque like you see in front of all places where um, you know, Jews were sadly, um, they knocked on doors and they you know, carried Jews off to the concentration camps and so there are inset, pl inset plaques. If you, you know, perhaps some of you have traveled to Berlin, you'll see these plaques all over. So there is a plaque um, in the sidewalk in front of what was the Carmel that she entered. There's also um, a plaque on the um, uh, brick on what is now standing there now. I'm not sure um, what exactly is in there, but um, there were white roses sort of stuck in behind the plaque, and uh, a person that, you know, was sort of being our guide and showing us around this area uh, shared with us that there are always white roses there, um, that you'll never go by there, that there won't be white roses. And then if you walk down to the end of the street and sort of come back behind this area, there's a canal behind there and, you know, beautiful trees and there were families out with baby carriages. They, there were elderly people that were, you know, barely moving, walking hand in hand, and other people, middle age, upper middle age, walking along this canal. And then behind there, if you walk all the way down the street, there's also another chapel that is devoted to her. So um, it's, you know, very much a city that remembers Edith Stein. Um, and actually, we were put up by the archdiocese of Cologne, and, um, which is near the Cologne Cathedral. In terms of the visit to the Edith Stein archive, um, her own personal books are housed there, and they've, the Carmelite nuns have built a lovely addition uh, that has you know, wooden floors, another, um, an added-on room, for a library, they're collecting everything uh, that scholars are writing on Edith Stein and also on the history of World War II, especially in the Cologne area. Uh, but also, you will see such things as her mother's Jewish prayer book. And, you know, since I've studied biblical Hebrew, for, I studied for 
probably about five years and feel really drawn to that language. That was really powerful, a really powerful experience uh, for me. Um, but also, like, you know, um, you know, a German edition of, of St. John Henry Newman. Um, both her and St. Newman now, um, you know, are two adult converts uh, to the Catholic faith, and I think that they have a lot to say um, in terms of, you know, really speaking in, 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 I think, a really strong sense. I think they're the future of the church in terms of catechesis and, you know, um, how to do adult formation in the church. Uh, the, the nuns there were just incredibly generous. Uh, they, um, you know, let us, you know, take photos. Um, you know, I have video of all the books, you know, that belonged to Edith. They were, you know, in sort of the center front with glass over them. But they also took us down to the uh, crypt, which was a really moving experience. And of course, since her body does, does her physical remains do not exist to be, you know, placed down there. Nonetheless, they have a plaque down there and sort of an area in the corner set aside um, to, you know, remember her. And then you'll see the crypt where, you know, the nuns that reside there are eventually buried and the ones who have already been buried, which is a deeply personal place for a Carmel, you know, convent. And so, um, that was really moving to spend time down there and just to also have a sense of, you know, a strong sense of human mortality. Um, the other thing that I want to share about Cologne is that at Borsenplatz, in the middle of a Catholic institutional center, and you have a really strong sense walking around Cologne, you'll find a church on every corner. I believe there are at least a dozen in addition to the, you know, towering Cologne Cathedral. But you'll find, you know, these churches that are old, especially by U.S. standards here, you know, all over. And it's really interesting because I did not know that it was near St. Gerion where the Carmel was. But when I first got there, well, I went to bed and slept for, you know, several hours. But then, you know, I got up and I tore off and went walking because I, you know, with traveling and, and you probably know how it is sitting for a long time, I just tore off and in one direction, not knowing my way, and I ended up in what I later realized, it, it, this didn't even hit me for several months actually, that it was as if I was just led, I went to St. Gerion Church. It was like I was going to St. Gerion Church and I didn't know that that was, you know, the Carmel, the original Carmel was near there. Um, and uh, uh, that church was, heavily damaged during World War II and had to be uh, rebuilt, but uh, it too is near the Institutional Center of Catholicism in Cologne. And there is an Edestein monument, or you know what in German would be called a Denkmal, that reflects really, you know, the perspectival thinking that is you know, looking at something from different perspectives, um, and it causes one to ask the question when you look at this monument, who is Edith Stein? Who is Saint Teresa Benedicta of the Cross? Is she one person or all three? Because there are three different general views of her, along with many other views, depending on what you're looking at, at this huge monument. So the first sculpture of Edith Stein at this monument, if you look at it from one angle, 
There is eat a shine with the star of David. And that is out of respect for her Jewish origins and her Jewish roots. The second sculpture that they have there connecting is reflective of existential angst or really no faith and her loss of faith. And so a really um, generous and healthy way of addressing her journey of faith is to talk about how she moves from Judaism to this existential angst. And, you know, she talks in her uh, autobiography, in her letters, about just, you know, not caring if she was, you know, hit by something or run over and so forth. But she went through with her philosophical studies a really deep search about the meaning of life. And I think that's why she's so relatable today, especially, for example, I'm hoping that my college students at uh, St. Ambrose, who are going to read her book on Husserl and St. Thomas Aquinas, Faith and Knowledge is the name of her volume, I hope that they you know, will learn to um, enjoy reading her. But then she moves from this existential angst period um, to a period where she is St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross. So during, with the second sculpture then, it reflects this loss of faith. Okay, so um, from certain viewpoints, you can see all of her. From other viewpoints, you see sort of the whole works. Um, and she looks to be divided and her life kind of fragmented. Um, and then the third sculpture is of St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross as she is clothed in Carmel. And it's clearly, you can see that in the sculpture, wearing the garments of her order. And then the other place that I visited, uh, we took the train along the Rhine River and to Freiburg, which is where she reserved, where she received her uh, doctorate. And outside Freiburg, there's a place, it's, it's kind of a suburb, so we took a train from the, uh, you know, from Freiburg. There is a suburb called Gunderthal. And in the suburb, there is St. Leoba, which is a Benedictine monastery. Uh, it used to be housed, the Benedictine uh, German, largely German Benedictine sisters used to reside there. Um, and now uh, it's mainly um, Philippine nuns who are residing there, but it is in res they, they are in residence, so it is still a monastery today. And uh, she actually spent time there, and uh, there's also a restaurant uh, near the train where you come in, uh, where she ate, and she talks about this um, in her writings. Uh, she ate there. Uh, after having her doctoral exam, she celebrated there. I'd like now uh, to turn to Stein and to her timeline to give you an idea of the chronology. I'm not going to cover every single thing. You can look up a chronology online or, uh, you know, uh, peruse one in, in the back of one of these uh, books. Uh, but the first thing I want to do is, you know, just talk and sort of key in on, uh, you know, the time that she was doing her studies and, you know, working on her uh, doctorate. And then I'll sort of just give a, a quick general uh, timeline. 
So her initial higher education takes place at the University of Breslau for two years, from 1911 to 1913. And remember, this is her hometown, now Rorikla, Poland. And while she's enrolled in a psychology seminar studying uh, problems associated with the psychology of thought, she repeatedly comes across references to the work of Edmund Husserl. And she's given the second volume of his work called uh, Logische Untersuchungen, which is Logical Investigations, and she reads it and decides to pursue the study of phenomenology. Um, I should probably say a few words about what phenomenology is, and I'll just say a few sentences, um, and you can, that's something maybe you can do as homework and find out more about it, because it gets quite complicated quickly. But phenomenology is a method uh, for reflexive critique. What is reflexive critique? It's thinking about our thinking about things. Um, and the purpose is to show the truth apart from any presuppositions or assumptions that we would bring to bear on something. So it's, you know, the idea with Husserl was to cut through any prejudices or prejudgments that we might have. Um, so Husserl thinks that there's an inhibition involved when it comes to one's lived experience in terms of our you know, prior concerns, our assumptions, and knowledge can distort that experience. So it points out those presumptuous notions, the idea with phenomenology is to point those out, that enter into our process of understanding. So it's looking at how we reach an understanding. It's sort of taking that process apart, looking at it as indeed a process. So he wants to devise a method that allows what is intentional about meaning in the world, you know, and, and what is meaningful to us um, to be revealed to the attentive philosopher. And so, you know, it involves demonstrating how lived experience points beyond itself to intentional structures of consciousness. And he follows in the footsteps of his teacher, uh, Brentano, Conscious acts which intend meaning, such as when we perceive or judge or wish or imagine, are directed toward an ideal unity of me meaning. Okay? So then consciousness becomes less about our own subjectivity and more about some sort of transcendental subjectivity insofar as consciousness points at you know, what is the intention at intended meanings that go beyond our everyday empirical consciousness and that can only be brought into actuality through lived experience in the world, okay? So that's just a, a you know, just a really simplistic, basic thing. I still struggle with, you know, how to define phenomenology when someone asks me. Um, because as I say, it gets really, you just sort of, it's like quicksand because when you start engaging in conversation with people, other people might bring a more personal perspective to a meaning that is intended with a certain word, for example. And that's why sometimes, and this happens within the church, it's happening within our country, and it's happening within our world, we end up we're talking past each other because we might attach different meaning or have different experience that impacts the meaning of what we normally would consider. That's not to relativize things at all because the intention is to, to strive for the truth of who we are and who we are as a human project, okay? But it's just to acknowledge that we're all at different points in that process We've all had different experiences. What do we share in life? We share a relationship, okay? But we have different relationships that are impacting our experience. And so then we get into a whole area of what we call hermeneutics and interpretation 
textual interpretation, basically, okay, whether it be scripture or whether it be um, uh, textual interpretation to do with, you know, the back, uh, say, the academic area of psychology, uh, theology, philosophy, especially. Okay, so I just wanted to go out a little bit with that to, to be able to contextualize now what I'll be sharing um, uh, about Edith Stein. Um, so she learns about phenomenology and she says, quote, it fascinated me tremendously because it consisted precisely of such a labor of clarification and because here one forged one's own mental tools for the task at hand. In other words, we can't go according to what somebody else thinks. We can learn from others and we can attend school in which knowledge is passed down through the ages, but she was interested in this process of understanding and what an individual human person brings to that. In other words, respect for individuality and for, you know, human persons in the world. So she transfers eventually to uh, Göttingen and studies there during 1913-1914 under Husserl. And she also studies the philosophy of Theodore Lips, which includes concepts in aesthetics, this is something that's so important today, especially in, in light of um, you know, our, our climate and um, environment and so forth, uh, to learn to appreciate the beauty around us as we sometimes fly around from here to there. Um, so this includes concepts in aesthetics, ethics, and social philosophy, as well as theory of knowledge, logic, and metaphysics. And, you know, her writings span all of these areas. That's what's so incredibly remarkable about her brilliance. Stein writes, quote, for the first time I encountered here what was to be repeatedly my experience. Books were of no use to me at all until I had clarified the matter in question by my own effort. This excruciating struggle to attain clarity was waged unceasingly inside me, depriving me of rest day and night. Her studies then were interrupted by the outbreak of World War I when she took time off to tend to wounded soldiers, and eventually she returns to her studies and earns her PhD. She's received into the Roman Catholic Church in 1922, she teaches at a Dominican girls' high school and teachers' training institute, St. Magdalena's. She also lectures extensively throughout Germany, Austria, and Switzerland for several years. And in 1932, she holds a position as a lecturer at the German Institute for Scientific Pedagogy in Münster, although it is short-lived because due to a Nazi degree, that comes out in 1933, she's prevented from holding an academic position because of her Jewish roots. And so she enters the Carmel at Cologne and eventually receives her chosen name, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, at her acceptance ceremony as a novice in 1934, followed by first vows in 1935 and then final profession of vows in 1938. And because of the growing threat in Germany during this time, on New Year's Eve in 1938, she is hauled, well, I, she's not hauled, she, is, she prays in the chapel of uh, Mary of Peace, and then she is sort of smuggled across the border into the Netherlands where she takes up residence and the, the Eck Carmel had agreed to take her. There was also in the works uh, for her and her sister Rosa, who went with her, also was in the works um, ultimately that they would eventually take up residence in Switzerland, although uh, she was taken by the Nazis, she and her sister, abruptly in August of 1942, uh, and you know, on August 2nd, and then you know, within a week she perished at Auschwitz. Okay, 
Um, in the interest of time, I'm just looking at my watch. I'm going to leave her the other chronology of key dates out. And what I'd like to do now is focus on um, looking at her, you know, saying a few words about her theology, her philosophy, and her spirituality. And so, uh, first of all, with regard to her theology, um, she details the spiritual journey of union and the teachings of her spiritual father in the science of the cross. What she does is she personalizes and appropriates John's theological anthropology by bringing the language of her own philosophical anthropology and her academic background to bear on his work and lends clarity and modernity uh, to the interpretation of his text. She also presents the reader with an outline of the work, and she's concerned with meaning, and that's what Husserl, what is so important about Husserl is that uh, she entitles the section Meaning of the Science of the Cross and the Essentials of Its Origins. She pursues the living truth of John's life and in so doing pursues her own as well. She asserts that a person who seeks after truth lives principally from the heart with an actively engaged intellect. This person, rather than collecting knowledge for its own sake, perhaps lives closer to the divine as truth, she says, into its own inmost center than it is consciously aware of. For both John and Stein, this is an experience both of yearning and suffering for the divine. So there's ascent and descent as the capacity for the divine grows so, the, so that the soul perceives the difference in contemplative uh, prayer between a, spirit, a superior spiritual part and a lower and sensory part. She describes the soul in contemplation as being structured as a spirit such that there is opposition between what is internal and what is external. And this really goes to the core of what she brings theologically as an incredible gift to the church. She does this in modern contemporary language, aware of the use and employment of language in the humanities and the human sciences. So spiritual life rises up out of the depths of the primal life of the unconscious and rising movements known as thoughts of the heart, not thoughts in the usual sense, become something that can be interiorly perceived, with the result being that spiritual faculties split off and form conceivable structures or active spiritual energies of thought, such as knowing and loving, and this is really important in terms of uh, discernment, of the movements of the mind and the impulses of the will. Whatever is allowed an entrance does so at a proper depth level. The created spirit who only wants to do the right action has placed its will in the divine will. If such a spirit is uncertain as to whether the action that the person, you know, he or she is going to carry out, then discernment is lacking and points to the fact that the deepest center is not yet open. So, you know, she carries this um, experience. Certain objects carry both knowledge of the divine and an energy of an encountering the other. However, one must learn how to listen in order to have a sense of the other, and that's, you know, one of the most important things is, you know, the gift of being able to listen. One will know that a spiritual transformation is occurring in this experience of relationship motivated by love as the capacity to receive and give love freely for the sake of God, the highest action one comes to grows in human experience and is related to the search for truth as knowledge of reality grows. This act of knowing involves human freedom in the realm of the spirit and is a gift of the contemplative life. The human person must discover itself anew in terms of a dual sense in that it must learn to know itself, but so that's not only the head, but it must come to be in its embodiedness and in everything about being part of the world, sharing in the world, it must be what it is destined to be because everyone has a vocation. 
I'd like now to say just a few words about her philosophy. And I'm just going to sort of cut to the core for the interest of time here. But what is so important to her philosophy for the church and what I believe one of the important, most important gifts she gives in terms of philosophy to the church and it's really what I would refer to as a philosophical diamond in the rough. Or another way to put it is that if we think of that diamond not being in the rough now, but the jewel in the crown of her sainthood and so forth. But we can't make any mistake about what kind of a crown we're talking about here, and especially today as we rem remember her on her feast day. It is a crown of thorns, and it is a journey of suffering. But nevertheless, something for the life of the church, for the life of the world, comes out of this, and I think that this is what makes her philosophy so incredibly important, is that if we look at the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, who's an important 20th century philosopher, of developing this concept of the meaningful in life and intentionality in terms of, to the, he develops intentionality philosophically to the point of us being in the world, okay? What I think Edith Stein does, and she is in conversation, indeed she has conversations in person with Martin Heidegger, um, prior to her entering the Carmel. I think if, if we say Heidegger is credited with intentionality in the world, what Stein does is further expands this notion of intentionality and ultimately though, you know, he talks, Heidegger talks about care and concern, but the you know, we're on the road to death, you know, and that is, we don't want to deny that, that is the human condition. But she expands the intentionality of consciousness to the point of self-transcendence of intentionality in personal self-giving. And if we make a theological turn with that, it is that personal self-giving in tri-personal relationship with the Trinity. So she develops this intentionality to the point of transcendence of personal self-giving such that what wells up in her theologically is a tri-personal life. She has a deep sense of that and she expresses this this comes through in all of her writings. And so while Heidegger has that horizontal relationship of all of us being connected as human beings, what she does is she's saying with the development of individuality and the personal self-giving, relationally speaking, what is going on vertically is relationship with the tripersonal God. And so all of our relationships, relational awareness, you know, fits into this. So I think she has a really significant gift. Um, this is part of my case for why, and I will be making this case, um, why her philosophy is so important and what a gift to the church and to the world it is. Because we can carry that relationship with the Trinity, with the tripersonal God, we can t carry it deeply and richly and still be in, you know, the hard relationships that we have, you know, taking care of human need um, in, you know, being in relationship and being in, in, in prayerful relationship, in working relationship, or just holding relationship in awareness. We can be authentically who we are by carrying that, not lightly, but deeply, but in a way that we've got that. And so 
we can maybe, you know, listen a little more to people who disagree with us or might not see things the same way or might have had an experience um, that precludes them being able to be decent to us on a given day or, you know, in a given year or, or you know, we see all the polarization in our church, in our world, in politics and so forth and the clamoring now for, you know, natural resources and so forth. And so in terms of war and violence and so forth, there is so much depth and riches to her work. I wish she wasn't quite as relevant today, her work, her body of work that is. Uh, but this came home all the more to me. I've lived my academic life in that space between World War I and World War II. And it's weighed heavily on me, you know, for, you know, what, well, I don't want to say, but about 40 years. It's weighed heavily on me, but never has it taken on more pronounced meaning for me personally than over the last six months with what's going on and the wounds that are being reopened in, in Europe. So uh, that's a word for her philosophy. And then just in terms of, of you know, Carmelite spirituality, and I'll, I'll end with that. In terms of uh, Carmelite spirituality, um, you know, the charism of the Carmelites is that, you know, uh, person in relationship, the individual in relationship to the community. And so uh, another way of putting that is relational awareness. And so um, it, it, the Carmelite tradition goes back to Mount Carmel. It's a school of spirituality in the same way that there are the Benedictines and the Dominicans and, and so forth. Um, and it dates back, you know, to around the year 1200 um, in Carmel, in the Holy Land, when a small group of men formed a religious community near a spring, uh, the Fountain of Elijah. Um, it, it eventually, you can look up the history in lots of different places, but eventually women are able to uh, join. And the other thing about the Carmelites is there, there are really two traditions. The Marian tradition and the Elijah tradition are united in the institution for the order. So devotion is to Mary as patroness of the order. And that's not bad, our Jewish mother. Um, and, and so Carmelite spirituality then is provided with these two uh, figures, Mary and Elijah. Elijah is portrayed as a mediating human being who changes his ways upon receiving a divine call, while Mary is prayerfully obedient in submitting her will to the divine will. That's sort of the points of emphases if you look at, you know, from an historical perspective, how the order originates. Um, so, you know, forms of spiritual life such as prayer, the use of religious imagery, and sacramental ritual ritual are central to Carmelite spirituality, although nothing uh, can take the place of God. Um, so, you know, attention is drawn in Carmelite texts to the importance of the activity of God as experienced in contemplation. Um, so human effort has limits, but divine, divine life does not. Contemplative prayer is in service to the world. To pray is to have an awareness of the divine presence and to carry that divine presence as Edith Stein did um, into the world. And so Carmelites listen to and accompany others on the spiritual journey such that they are encouraged to be themselves. And that is, and I think this is a really important point, and it's so in keeping with her theory of empathy that she develops in her doctoral dissertation. Empathy is valued over issuing advice and admonishment. It is how one serves that is important, which is to say one should serve lovingly.